Hi, I'm Eddie Martucci. I am the pharmacist manager at the Big Y Walpole on routes uh, 27 and route one. Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about COVID-19, uh, seasonal flu and other cross-species vi cross viruses and how together we can stop them. Um, what is COVID-19? And there's a nice little picture of a coronavirus and that's what it is. It stands for the COVID-19 is severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus number two or SARS-CoV-2 which is analogous to COVID-19. As you can see that it is a crowned virus. That's why they call it a coronavirus. It looks like it has little crowns under electron microscope. You know, we ran, um, I've done this talk in Westwood and so my son watched it on there and he's, uh, he's kind of a science geek. So his only comment was great electron microscope slides, dad. Um, so that's what they are. The SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 virus is a zoonotic virus. And that means it comes to humans from animals. The incubation period is about 6.4 days. It's extremely virulent. Two to three people become infected with the coronavirus for every one person that they come in contact to that is COVID positive. Whereas with the seasonal flu, it's less than one to one. It's a single stranded RNA virus. It's spread by droplets from the infected host through eyes, nose, and mouth of the person coming in contact with them. Very similar to MERS and SARS. MERS stands for Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome and SARS um, stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Um, the renaming happened in about 2015 by the CDC where they wanted to name viruses without basing where they came from as a source, who they infected as a, a population, and what countries that it came from. So that way it doesn't really point exactly to one thing. Um, and it is a very cold weather virus for two reasons. It seems to be more virulent in the cold weather, plus the human's re uh, responses to fighting off infection aren't as active in cold weather. The cilia in our nose aren't as active. We don't have, a, you know, ours get dry in the wintertime in cold weather, so we can't really fight off infections. The other virus is that it's very similar to is SARS which happened to come from the, the civet cat. And if you look at that cat, he kind of looks cuddly, but he kind of looks scary. Uh, so I don't know if I would go out and hug one of those fellows if I came across one. Um, but that was a, a virus that happened in China in 2003 and 2002. Uh, the MERS virus, which happened in 2012, mostly in Saudi Arabia, came from the camel. And our virus in 2019 came from the bat. So again, they're zoonotic viruses, meaning they come from animals to humans. The stage one symptoms of COVID infestation or infection um, are listed on your screen. You can see the percentage of people that represent with those symptoms who test positive for COVID. Fatigue, cough, fever, sore throat, increased sputum. Comesia means that our, the inside of our nose is a little swollen. Um, and then myalgia, which are aches and pains. The listed, the three listed in red are new as of May uh, symptoms, chills, loss of smell, and anorexia, because this is something that in our day and age, we now have the um, technology to keep abreast of things. So they are adding new symptoms. They're gonna add, as you'll see in a few slides further, some added risk groups as well. When you move from stage one to stage two, you get into more severe symptoms. So you have a severe cough, dyspnea, which means we have trouble breathing, hypoxema, which means that our blood oxygen level is low. And I know that in uh, May and April, the pharm our pharmacy ran out of pulse ox meters and we could no longer even order them because people wanted to know if their slight fever had to do with COVID. So they were looking at their blood oxygen level. And that will lead to respiratory distress and respiratory failure. Um, the very harsh part of COVID-19 was that 20% of the people who become hospitalized due to COVID-19 need respiratory intervention. And as we saw in Italy and a little bit in the United States, 
that we didn't have enough respirators to go around. In Italy, it was very bad. They were triaging people and, and saying, well, this person has a much better chance of making it, so we'll use a respirator on patient A, and patient B, we're gonna do the best we can, but good luck. Uh, not really a way we wanna deal with it. I know in the US, we um, had a lot of resources to be able to increase our production of respirators so that the hospitals didn't have a shortage of them. What are the risk factors for becoming infected with COVID-19? The risk factors are that if you're an adult, you're two to three times more prevalent to get COVID-19 than children. Children are great carriers um, and they don't seem to become symptomatic. So they can carry the COVID with them. Uh, if you're over the age of 65, if you're over the age of 80 in a nursing home, if you have heart disease, respiratory disease, diabetes, or immunocompromised, those are the major risk factors that they found out in March and April as to um, becoming COVID infected. In May, they added the next two categories down below. BMI stands for body mass index, and a body mass index over 40 is normally um, associated with somebody who's obese. You have HIV positive, homelessness, and low income. I want to talk about those for just a second. A lot of times, the people who have low income are more at risk because they have jobs that are service jobs. They don't have the best health insurance, so they probably can't go to see a doctor when they're first starting to feel um, a little under the weather. They are people that can't miss a day of work. They're people that have to go to work because they don't have two or three or four or five weeks of paid time off. So those are the two that are new added as of um, May of this year. And then you have people who have cancer, uh, kidney disease and liver disease as well. Those are now some of the new risk factors for getting COVID-19. The World Health Organization um, decided to have some strategies to try to stop this pandemic. Uh, what they wanted to do is they wanted to interrupt human to human interactions. They wanted to identify, isolate and care for all the COVID positive people. They wanted to decrease exposure of COVID by identifying where it came from and isolating that source. They wanna communicate both critical event information and critical risk information. And one of the ways that they wanted to implement those above um, plans was so that it decreased social and economic disruption in our normal lives. I put together a little timeline about the COVID-19. I skewed it towards the Commonwealth because that's where we are. So it, you can see on the screen that it shows that in December of 2019, there was a severe pneumonia outbreak in the Wuhan province of China. Um, about a month and a half later, the World Health Organization declared that that was a public health emergency. In 30 more days, they found that there were over 80,000 confirmed cases. And then just 10 days later after that, they said that there were 113,000 cases with 4,000 deaths, which was a huge jump in just 10 days. You can see most of that occurred in China. On uh, March 11th, the World Health Organization declared that it was a global pandemic. Pandemic. The United States mandated shelter in place in April. And all of, most of us states in the union took place in that. Um, and what that was is to try to keep people away from each other. Um, and then we started to open up again because this pharmacist enjoys golfing. Uh, stage one, I was very happy that we were allowed to go golfing again. They did have some restrictions when we did that. You could only have one person in the car, uh, but if you walked, you were fine. You could just stay away from uh, each other. And of course, if I'm having a bad round, I guess I don't want anybody else with me anyway. And then in June 15th, you can see we had stage two opening. June, July 9th, we had stage three opening. August 3rd, Governor Baker listed the safe travel states, which meant that you could go to those states, come back to the Commonwealth, and you didn't have to isolate for 14 days or get a negative COVID test. Now, our little sister Rhode Island in New England, you see that's New England, New York, and New Jersey. Uh, Rhode Island is on and off the naughty list, depending on how her spikes of COVID tests happen. I put this slide in just to show how important this was and what a global pandemic means. You are entering a major metropolis, one of the largest cities in our country, and it's telling you that you have to separate yourself from other people. I thought that was a pretty uh, graphic telling of how we dealt with this global pandemic. 
by doing your sheltering in place, these are the things that we wanted to limit. You wanna to try to limit travel. You only want one person in the family doing the shopping, whether it be grocery shopping or other um, important shopping that you had to get done, anything that you needed to do. Social distancing, and that's staying six feet apart. And the major reason that six feet was chosen is because as we said earlier, COVID-19 is spread by droplets and they really can't travel that far. Uh, you would like to wear a mask and cover your nose and your mouth. You want to limit touching your eyes, nose and mouth because the COVID could be on your fingers and then that's how it gets into our system. So we did different things. We did elbow bumps instead of handshakes and air hugs. And then we did things with FaceTime and we had Zoom and virtual parties or celebrations. I know that we, my wife and I had um, a weekly Sunday night pizza party with our children via Zoom. So everybody would make a different pizza and then explain what they made. And you'd spend an hour together, at least you were trying to stay connected, which was very important in this uh, social distancing era. The most important thing that we can do, of course, is to sanitize. And these are just several pictures of how to wash our hands. Um, when you wash your hands, soap and water is great. Soap inactivates viruses, water flushes it off of our skin. You should wash your hands for 20 seconds vigorously. Vigorously also helps because what that does is it manually breaks up the viral cells so that they, don't, they can't live. Um, wash your hands for 20 seconds and that's singing the happy birthday song twice. You can sing it to yourself or out loud. My wife always makes me sing it to myself because she said that Motown and ABC Records would not want anything to do with recording my voice. Uh, one of the better ways that I've heard of how we should wash our hands is imagine that you're hosting a taco party or you're having tacos for dinner and you cut up a nice jalapeno to make your salsa. And now you want to put your contact lens in. How well are you going to wash your hands to make sure you get that jalapeno off of your fingers? Uh, to me, that was very graphic. Some of the effective agents are soap and water, as we mentioned. 75% alcohol, whether it's ethyl or isopropyl, doesn't matter. Hydrogen peroxide is very good at killing COVID-19. And then Clorox, Pine Sol, and Lysol, I use some of the brand names that we all shopped for in March uh, and were very disappointed in that many, many grocery stores didn't have it. Um, I'll let you in on a tip. I know the big Y gets there, those supplies on Sunday morning. So if you really want some, you show up on Sunday morning at big Y and you can see if we have any of those left. Um, but all of those agents are effective at killing the COVID-19 virus or SARS-CoV-2. Agents that are not effective, vinegar does not do anything. Ammonia really doesn't do anything. And I put sage in there because um, herbal uh, treatments of burning sage does diminish bacteria, but it doesn't do anything for viruses. So I wanted to put that in there as well. The next slide that I have up is the Reader's Digest slide. And I put this in here because this actually is a very good site that tells you the difference between a bacteria and a virus. It tells you what will kill them and what won't. It also goes into other things. Um, you know, when you talk about how people sterilize their instruments at your doctor's office, your dentist's office, they use autoclaves and that's heat. So it tells you what you can use for heat. If you put your dryer on high, that probably would work. There's probably enough heat if you run it for 20 or 30 minutes. So when you wash your uh, mask, which you should wash every day if you have a cloth, cloth mask, you can wash it in hot soap and water in your washer and then put it in the dryer and that should kill any viruses that are on there. Uh, if you do go to this site, you do have to like Flo from Progressive because her commercials are spread out through all, throughout all of that. One of the ways to tolerate it is that it'll tell you jokes while you're there too if you let it. This next slide shows us how long the, an active COVID virus can live on something that is not animate, an inanimate object. So on tissue paper, it's about three hours. That's why they recommend that if you use a tissue paper, throw it away right away. Don't save it, don't throw it in your pocket or put it underneath your sleeve like my Aunt Media used to do. Throw it, throw it in the garbage. Wooden cloth is about two days. A surgical mask is a day. Um, if you have a surgical mask, I know we have them on sale at the store for $26 for 50. And when I was wearing the surgical masks, and I do occasionally, uh, I use it for one day and I throw it out. I don't bother to try to sanitize it or clean it. Uh, glass and cash for money, uh, four days. 
stainless steel, plastic, seven days, and copper, uh, 10 days. And nobody really knows why that is. I tried to research why it would be that. Maybe it has to do with electronic conduction because copper is a very good conductor, but I couldn't find any definitive answer on that. So I just put down 10 days. I would like to talk about some of the drugs that have been used during COVID-19. Um, we've gotten a lot of information, a lot of news play about hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is an anti-malarial drug that's also used in lupus and some autoimmune diseases, specifically rheumatoid arthritis, and azithromycin, which is a macrolide antibiotic that's used for upper respiratory infections. We see a lot of that being prescribed in the winter. Um, this was not a double-blinded crossover study, which is a scientific way to do a study. Um, what they did is, in France, they had two small groups. People who had been hospitalized were on the mend, didn't need um, intensive respiratory therapy anymore. So they gave one group, there were 20 people in this group that got the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, and there were nine people in the group that got nothing, got a placebo. After six days, 13 of the 20 people had no COVID-19 virus in their system. In the group that had no medication, two of nine but it wasn't clinically significant and the risks are much higher uh, than the benefits. So you should not use hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin. I know that early in March, we got requests from healthcare professionals to fill the prescriptions. It was so um, rampant and the media had played that up so much that insurance companies actually sent us faxes and emails to say that we will only pay for hydroxychloroquine if the patient has a diagnosis, of lupus, um, malaria, or an autoimmune disease, and if they've had it before, and we won't pay for any more than one month at a time. Um, so they were looking at when people were just going to try to take it to see if it would prevent it. There was no proof that it did prevent anybody from becoming infected with the COVID-19 virus. Two drugs that were used when people were hospitalized was remdesivir and dexamethasone. Remdesivir is a drug used in HIV, it's an antiviral, and dexamethasone is a steroid anti-inflammatory drug. If people were hospitalized and they didn't need any extra oxygen, the drug of choice was remdesivir. If they needed oxygen but not invasive oxygen, so if you had a nasal cannula or an oxygen mask that they needed in the hospital, both drugs seem to be the drugs of choice that help them to progress to being well better and quicker. But if they needed an invasive oxygen therapy, which means that they had to oxygenate the lung tissues directly, then dexamethasone was the drug of choice. Now, that being said, they tried two different courses of therapy, five days and nine days. They found that there was no clinical significance between them. So five days is the way they went because five days drug therapy with remdesivir is $2,340. And that was covered through the insurance companies, through the government, the uh, FDA put in an emergency action plan. So anybody who really needed that at the hospitals, the insurance companies were given the money to pay for that. Let's talk a little bit about vaccines. The vaccine for COVID-19. Operation Warp Speed was put in place by the federal government. And what that did is it allowed three companies to bring their vaccine into stage three clinical trials, which means they used humans uh, quicker, very fast. Moderna, which is a Cambridge, Massachusetts company, and actually their vaccine was made in our neighboring town of Norwood, uh, brought theirs to stage three trials in July of this year, AstraZeneca in August, and Pfizer-BioNTech was this month that they brought them in. And if you look at your um, media, when you pull up your computer and you look at any of your search engines, you see that there are always pictures of somebody new trying the vaccine. When will it be available? We don't know. Uh, they were expecting, trying to get it available for January of 2021. People are speculating probably fall of 2021. I'm not sure of when it will be available. I do believe in herd immunity, which means that if you vaccinate 95% of the population against a certain pathogen, it goes away but is the virus going to work? We really have to see how that works and it has to be peer reviewed, the studies that they have done. One of the interesting pieces of information that came out of people being hospitalized was blood type differentials as to who is at higher risk. 
And it, this had, was not a scientific study. It was just taking data from people who were hospitalized. And they found that people who had blood type A seemed to be in the majority of getting COVID-19. And people who were in blood type O had, no, had a lower incidence of COVID-19. And what that means, if you're type A, you have the type A antigen on your blood cells. If you're B, you have the B antigen. If you're AB, you have both. And if you're O, you have neither. There weren't any clinical studies. It was just based on hospital admission data, but it's very interesting to find. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that there are a few other species on this planet, animal species, that share the same blood types as us, A, B, A, B, and O. And those are apes, bonobos, chimpanzees, and rats. And probably with the rats, that's why we probably do a lot of drug testing with rats, because a lot of their systems are similar to ours. If we're doing gastrointestinal testing for medications, we use a pig because their GI tract is very similar to ours. With flu season ahead, we have all kinds of questions going on. Should I get my flu vaccine early? Should I get my flu vaccine at all? Um, should I get two of them? The resounding answer is yes, you should get your seasonal flu vaccine. As I said earlier, I believe in herd immunity. I believe that we should all be vaccinated against the seasonal flu vaccine. And so that's something we really should have happen. Every year they change one or more of the, uh, most years they change one or more of the, uh, the phenotypes that are in the, the vaccine. It's a quadrivalent, so it has four strains of flu in there, two A's and two B's. This year they've changed three of the four strains. The two A strains and the egg-based immunity are now from China, Guangdong, Mayoan, and Hong Kong. The B strain was changed from Colorado to Washington State because that's where the cruise ships came in when COVID first came out uh, back in March, early March. And then uh, Phuket in Thailand has always been one of our staples in the B uh, of a B flu vaccine antigen. The cell mediated is a little different. The cell mediated is they use canine kidney cells to grow the vaccine. In the egg mediated, they use a chick embryo. That's why when you go to have your flu vaccine, they ask you, are you allergic to eggs? Are you allergic to chickens? Um, the cell mediated does replace the Guangdong with Hawaii, Hawaiian uh, strain. Um, and, but there's only one company that makes that. I know all the flu vaccine that we have at the Big Y and Walpole is all egg mediated uh, in that. Now, the other change that they've made this year with the flu vaccine is that the senior flu is a larger volume. Instead of a half of a milliliter, it's three quarters of a milliliter. And they found that people over the age of 65 who are recommended to get the high dose vaccine, um, they have a better antibody buildup. It takes two weeks for us to be mediated for that, to be fully immune. So should you get your flu vaccine this season? Absolutely. The optimum time for getting your flu vaccine is if you're healthy individual with no underlying um, health concerns, it's the second week of October through the second week of November. We spoke about this at our Coffees and Conversation last Tuesday or last Thursday. Uh, the, if you have any of those COVID risk factors that we have and the important ones that I would put up there are, are respiratory, uh, deficiencies, diabetes, uh, immunocompromised, and you may want to talk to your doctor about getting it early. Normally, if you get your vaccine between the second week of October and the second week of November, you're covered through the flu season, which covers us through January into February. About seven years, six, seven years ago, Massachusetts did have a very late B flu virus influenza outbreak that happened at the end of February. So if you waited a little longer till the second week of November, you might be a little bit more covered. Uh, people have asked questions, as we talked about last week, should they get a second flu vaccination, get one now in September and get a second one in January. And already those uh, talks are all over the media. And I've had personally two insurance companies send us uh, email saying they will only pay for one flu vaccine per season. So um, they're not very expensive if you had to pay yourself. The high dose is a little more expensive. It's about $75. The uh, regular quadrivalent flu vaccine is about $45. Uh, it certainly won't break you to, on your mortgage payment, but talk to your doctor first before you think of getting two viruses this season. I put up a slide here to talk about some other notable pandemics 
And uh, this information is as of yesterday for the top line for our COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. We've had over 27 million people infected with uh, just under 900,000 deaths for a 3.3% fatality rate. You can see Ebola, Ebola was much more virulent, but we didn't have the type of spread that we had. The first SARS virus in China of 2002, 2003, we had about 8,000 people. Again, about a 10% death rate. Um, and the Spanish flu, which happened a century ago, had 500 million people infected with over 50 million deaths. Uh, the swine flu that occurred in the United States um, in 2009 and 2010 had 60 million people with just under 600,000 deaths. Uh, the reason I put those last two up there is that for COVID-19, the way that our world works now, we were able to stop the spread. We, as you can see with the swine flu, we've only had a third of the number of people that were infected. So we would have had a lot more deaths. So it was very good that we were able to stop to get information out there, to do the social distancing, to get all those things done. One of the things that I did look at too is I looked at some of the Massachusetts data and as of yesterday, there were 123,000 people in Massachusetts that were infected with 9,000, little over 9,000 deaths. So Massachusetts death rate was a little higher than the national, the world average of 3.3% at 7.4%. But Norfolk County, that's our county that we live in, had 9,700 people infected with over 1,000 deaths. So that's about 10% death rate. Uh, which means that we're really not out of the woods yet. Remember to stay socially distant, to wash our hands, to wear our masks. In conclusion, those last three things is exactly what I wanted to say. Keep six feet apart if you can. Only shop with one person in the family if you can. Wear your mask over your nose and mouth and wash your hands. 20 seconds or like you have some jalapeno on your hands and you want to get it done. Um, I can open this up to questions, Sherry. There are a couple slides after questions that I just wanted to show. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'll stop our sharing here and then we can go to questions and then I'll share again afterwards. So who has questions? I do. Yes, go ahead, Linda. Um, yes, um, I want you to actually, if you can, explain why like Massachusetts might be higher on the incidence um, standard Certainly. than other. How, why do they think? What is, what is the reasoning behind that? Because it's a major metropolis and we have a major airport and some seaports that come into, uh, into play. Okay. So people come in and out of here. For New England, we are the gateway to New England. So that's right. one of the yeah. reasons. That's why California, okay. That's why California, Washington, and Chicago uh, were also the first uh, areas that were the highest hit. Yeah. What about like um, Florida and the southern states? What, in what, what regard? about this, in regards to the same? Uh, the you mean their new their new spikes? Is that what you're talking about? The later well, spikes at the spikes, end of April and and in May. The reason for that is. Uh, it is a cold weather virus. So uh, that's a very good question. Why uh, do we have hot spikes in those very hot states? And the reason is, is that because people aren't standing outside in the 100 degree weather, they're going inside to bars and to venues where there's music or just gathering where it's air conditioned and they're close together in crowded tables. So that's why they had their spikes. Yeah. Okay. Are there other questions? I guess not. Either I did really well or people are time for naps. I don't know what the, what the difference is. Let me share my screen again to just uh, show the last few slides that I have. Oh, you disabled me, Sherry. Can you undisable me? Oh boy, I knew how to do it. I think you just have to make me a host again. All right, hold on one second. Sure, sure. Okay. Says I am a host. Excellent.
So the next slide that I did want to say uh, after questions was not to get complacent. This is a map of the number of COVID cases that they have and the darker red, the more cases there are. Now the white states like Maine and Vermont, Wyoming, Montana, Alaska, and Hawaiian Islands doesn't mean that there are no COVID cases. It means that there are more than 50,000 uh, cases. That's where the white begins. But you can see that Massachusetts is in that bright crimson red. So we are not out of the woods yet. We shouldn't get complacent. We should make sure that we socially distance, that we wear our mask and that we wash our hands. This is a new world. We have a new way of interacting with each other. Uh, the sun is rising. The sun will rise every day. And together, I think we can greet this new world and uh, learn to live together and find other ways to be connected with all of our friends and family. What's the reason that the people over 65 need a higher dose of the um, They've just found They've just found that you, you don't need one. If you're a healthy individual and you don't have any underlying health issues, you don't need one. But they found that as we age, with, as with anything, all of our systems don't work as well as they used to. Our GI system doesn't absorb vitamins as well as it used to. Our eyesight isn't as good as it used to be. Uh, we can't run marathons as quickly as we used to. So the same thing with our immune system. Oh, okay. We can't build as many antibodies as we used to when we were 20 and 30 years old. So by giving a higher dose of antigen, that causes our immune system to cause a buildup of better antibodies. So that's the only reason that they suggest that people over 65 get the high dose. Um, I'm but you not could. at 65 yet, but when I get there, I'm going to get the high dose. Could you request to get the lower dose if you want? Of course to? you can. Of course you can. My the high dose I don't even have in stock yet. Uh, they've been promising it to me since the beginning of September. Uh, now they say by the end of September I should have my my uh, uh, full amount in. But you certainly can. I have many people over the age of sixty-five. Uh, actually, several that I golf with that are uh, you know very active. They walk the course. They're in their seventies. Uh, they don't have any underlying health conditions, specifically diabetes or uh, respiratory issues. Um, and so they get the regular uh, quadrivalent flu vaccine. And I do have plenty of that in stock. And we can vaccinate a big Y ages 14 and up. The state of Massachusetts allows pharmacies to vaccinate nine and above, but the doctor who signed off on our um, on our standing order would not go as low as nine. He would, it's only comfortable to go as low as 14. Is uh, sleep apnea, apnea considered one of those uh, high risk? Uh, no, sleep apnea is not. Sleep oh. apnea is, is a different type of a neurological uh, disorder when our bodies start to slow down at night uh, because it knows we want to sleep. Uh, that has really nothing to do with respiratory. It's more asthma. Um, and um, congestive pulmonary disease, uh, things like that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Sherry, thank you again for the opportunity to be able to do this. Uh, I'll be in touch with you guys again to set up another one when you guys are ready. I am writing a uh, follow-up to this talk that I know I'm giving to Westwood in uh, November. So maybe we can set a date in November, or December to do that. That'd be great. Yeah, definitely send us an Perfect. email. Thank you so much for being here. It's, it's certainly a very helpful information. So thank you. Thank you. Thank Stay you safe, so everybody. Thank, right. you, thank you. Thank you. Bye.